Hi, welcome to the Bedtime Story Series curated by Alice Privaro, uh, which itself is part of the 100 Day Studio Initiative organized by the Architecture Foundation here in London. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Blunderfield. I practice architecture at Henley Hale Brown Architects in London and teach an architecture diploma unit at the Kingdon's, Kingston School of Art uh, with Simon Henley. Um, and I also produce a podcast called Scaffold, which features interviews with architects as well as uh, artists and designers. Uh, and just further to that, I'll be doing a live interview tomorrow night for the 100 Day Studio with Yanina Gassai, who's an academic uh, based uh, at ETH in Switzerland. And we'll be talking about the changing roles and potentials of oral history in architectural research. So that's happening tomorrow night, uh, Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, with Zoom details available at the Architecture Foundation website. Um, so for tonight's bedtime story, I've actually chosen five very short stories. Um, each one's about three minutes long, uh, all written by the neuroscientist David Eagleman and collected in a book called Sum, 40 Tales from the Afterlives, which uh, was published in 2009. And the reason I chose these stories is, is this. Uh, we've all become sadly almost used to seeing the daily tally of deaths from the coronavirus. And uh, as I'm reading this, um, that number stands at around, or it stands at 285,252. Uh, and of course, it's growing by the hour uh, with each of those deaths representing someone that was loved and essential in other people's lives. Uh, I heard on the news this morning that here in the UK and elsewhere, this has sparked a renewed interest in religion, prayer, and a search for meaning, the meaning of life and death. And according to recent polls, despite the closure of churches, synagogues, mosques, and other places of worship, that number has shot up by almost 20%. Um, what I like about Eagleman's stories is that they offer up an opportunity for spiritual reflection um, but on a totally, on totally secular grounds and they speculate in different ways about how our experience of the afterlife, um, may play out, which I'm finding so comforting right now. Uh, so you're probably wondering what this has to do with architecture and it's actually not that much of a stretch as architects, uh, in a way, I think we're already designing for the afterlife. Um, although this may no longer be the case for many buildings, one would still hope at least that the built environment outlasts the people who bring it into being. So architecture is out of necessity, concerned with the long view. And when we take this long view, when we see a world with us completely removed from the picture, uh, in a way, I think it's kind of like having a near death experience, um, which has the potential to bring the same sense of possibility and transcendence that Eagleman's stories embody. So here we go. Five very short stories from David Eagleman's uh, Some 40 Tales from the Afterlives. Some. In the afterlife, you relive all your experiences but this time with the events reshuffled into a new order. All the moments that share equality are grouped together. You spend two months driving the street in front of your house, seven months having sex. You sleep for 30 years without opening your eyes. For five months straight, you flip through magazines while sitting on a toilet. You take all your pain at once, all 27 intense hours of it. Bones break, cars crash, skin is cut, babies are born. Once you make it through, it's agony free for the rest of your afterlife. But that doesn't mean it's always pleasant. You spend six days clipping your nails, 15 months looking for lost items, 18 months waiting in line, Two years of boredom, staring out a bus window, sitting in an airport terminal, one year reading books, 
your eyes hurt and you itch because you can't take a shower until it's your time to take your marathon 200 day shower. Two weeks wondering what happens when you die. One minute realizing your body is falling. 77 hours of confusion. One hour realizing you've forgotten the name of the person you're talking to. Three weeks realizing you're wrong. Two days lying. Six weeks waiting for a green light. Seven hours vomiting. 14 minutes experiencing pure joy. Three months doing laundry. 15 hours writing your signature. Two days tying shoelaces. 67 days of heartbreak. Five weeks driving lost. Three days calculating restaurant tips. 51 days deciding what to wear. Nine days pretending you know what is being talked about. Two weeks counting money. 18 days staring into the refrigerator. 34 days longing. Six months watching commercials. Four weeks sitting in thought, wondering if there is something better you could be doing with your time. Three years swallowing food. Five days working buttons and zippers. Four minutes wondering what your life would be like if you reshuffled the order of events. In this part of the afterlife, you imagine something analogous to your earthly life. And the thought is blissful. A life where episodes are split into tiny swallowable pieces, where moments do not endure, where one experiences the joy of jumping from one event to the next, like a child hopping from spot to spot on the burning sand. So that was the first story called Sum. The next one I'm going to read is called Circle of Friends. When you die, you feel as though there was some subtle change, but everything looks approximately the same. You get up and brush your teeth. You kiss your spouse and kids and leave for the office. There is less traffic than normal. The rest of your building seems less full, as though it's a holiday. But everyone in your office is here, and they greet you kindly. You feel strangely popular. Everyone you run into is someone you know. At some point, it dawns on you that this is the afterlife. The world is only made up of people you've met before. It's a small fraction of the world population, about 0.0002%, but it seems like plenty to you. It turns out that only the people you remember are here. So the woman with whom you shared a glance in the elevator may or may not be included. Your second grade teacher is here with most of the class, your parents, your cousins, your spectrum of friends through the years, all your old lovers, your boss, your grandmothers, and the waitress who served you food each day at lunch. Those you dated, those you almost dated, Mm, those you longed for. It is a blissful opportunity to spend quality time with your thousand connections, to renew fading ties, to catch up with those you let slip away. It is only after several weeks of this that you begin to feel forlorn. You wonder what's different as you saunter through the vast, quiet parks with a friend or two. No strangers grace the empty park benches. No family unknown to you throws breadcrumbs from the ducks for the ducks and makes you smile because of their laughter. As you step into the street, you note there are no crowds, no buildings teeming with workers, no distant cities bustling, no hospitals running 24-7 with patients dying and staff rushing, no trains howling into the night with sardined passengers on their way home, very few foreigners, you begin to consider all the, un all the things unfamiliar to you. You've never known, you realize, how, how to vulcanize rubber to make a tire. And now those factories stand empty. 
You've never known how to fashion a silicone chip from beach sand, how to launch rockets into the atmosphere, how to pit olives or lay railroad tracks. And now those industries are shut down. The missing crowds make you lonely. You begin to complain about all the people you could be meeting, but no one listens or sympathizes with you because this is precisely what you chose when you were alive. Okay, this next short story is called Quantum. <clears throat> Here in the afterlife, everything exists in all possible states at once, even states that are mutually exclusive. This comes as a shock after your earthly life, where making one choice causes the other choices to disappear. When you become a lover to one, you cannot become a lover to others. When you choose one door, others are lost to you. In the afterlife, you can enjoy all possibilities at once, living multiple lives in parallel. You find yourself simultaneously eating and not eating. You are bowling and not bowling at the same time. You are horseback riding and nowhere near a horse. A velvety blue angel gently descends to see how you're coming along with the afterlife. This is all too confusing for a poor human brain, you confess to the angel. The angel rubs his chin. Maybe we can ease you into this with something simpler, like a day job, he offers. You are immediately dropped into a work life of simultaneous contradictions. You are concurrently practicing several careers at once. All the careers you had considered when you were younger. You simultaneously count down your rocket ship launch and defend a criminal client in front of a jury. In the same moments, you scrub your hands for a gallbladder surgery and navigate an 18-wheeler down a New Mexico interstate. Gone are the constraints of location and time. This, you tell the angel, is too much work. Perhaps we could warm you up with a simpler situation, he concludes. How would you like to be in a closed room, one-on-one, -on -one, with your lover? And then you are here. You are simultaneously engaged in her conversation and thinking about something else. She both gives you herself and does not give herself to you. You find her objectionable and you deeply love her. She worships you and wonders what she might have missed with someone else. Thank you, you tell the angel. I'm used to this. That was called Quantum um, by the neuroscientist and writer David Eagleman. The second to last story I'm going to read is called Search. In the moment of transition between life and death, only one thing changes. You lose the momentum of the biomechanical systems that keep the machinery running. In the moment before death, you are still composed of the same thousand trillion trillion atoms in the, uh, as in the moment after death. The only difference is that their neighborly network of social interactions has ground to a halt. At that moment, the atoms begin to drift apart, no longer enslaved to the goals of keeping up a human form. The interacting pieces that once constructed your body begin to unravel like a sweater, each thread spiraling off in a different direction. Following your last breath, those thousand trillion trillion atoms begin to blend into the earth around you. As you degrade, your atoms become incorporated into new constellations. The leaf of a staghorn fern, a spectacled snail shell, a kernel of maize, a beetle's mandible, a waxen bloodroot, a ptarmigan's tail feather. But it turns out your thousand, trillion, trillion atoms were not an accidental collection. Each was labeled as composing you and continues to be so wherever it goes. So you're not alone and you're not gone. You're simply taking on different forms. Instead of your gestures being the raising of an eyebrow or of a blown kiss, 
Now a gesture might consist of a rising gnat, a waving wheat stalk, and the inhaling lung of a breaching beluga whale. Your manner of expressing joy might become a seaweed sheet playing on a lapping wave, a pendulous funnel dancing from a cumulonimbus, a flapping grunion birthing, a glossy river pebble gliding around an eddy. From your pleasant, clumped point of view, this afterlife may sound unnervingly distributed, but in fact, it is wonderful. You can't imagine the pleasure of stretching your redefined body across vast territories, ruffling your grasses and bending your pine branch and flexing an egret's wings while pushing a crab towards the surface through coruscating shafts of light. Lovemaking reaches heights it could only it could never dream of in the compactness of human corporality. Now you can communicate in many places along your bodies at once. You weave your versatile hands over your lover's multiflorous figure. Your rivers run together. You move in concert as interdigitating creatures of the meadow, entangled vegetation bursting from the fields, caressing weather fronts that climax into thunderstorms. Just as in your current life, the downside is that you are always in flux. As creatures degrade and your fruits fall and rot, you become capable of new gestures and lose others. Your lover might drift away from you in the migratory flight of tropic birds, a receding stampede of wintering elk, or a creek that quietly pokes its head under the ground and pops up somewhere unknown to you. Many of your same problems apply. Temptation, anguish, anger, distrust, vice, and don't forget the dread arising from free choice. Don't be fooled into believing that plants grow mechanically towards the sun, that birds choose their direction by instinct, that wildebeest migrate by design. In fact, everything is seeking. Your atoms can spread, but they cannot escape the search. A wide distribution does not shield you from wondering how best to spend your time. Once every few millennia, all your atoms pull together again, traveling from around the globe like the leaders of nations, uniting for a summit, converging for their densest reunion in the form of a human. They are driven by nostalgia to regroup the tight pinpoint geometry in which they began. In this form, they can relish a forgotten sense of holiday-like intimacy. They come together and search for something they once knew but didn't appreciate at the time. The reunion is warm and heartening for a while, but it isn't long before they begin to miss their freedom. In the form of a human, the atoms suffer a claustrophobia of size. Gestures are agonizingly limited, restricted to the foundering of tiny limbs. As a condensed human, they cannot see around corners. They can only talk within short distances to the nearest ear. They cannot reach out to touch across any meaningful expanses. We are the moment of least facility for the atoms. And in this form, they find themselves longing to ascend mountains, wander the seas, and conquer the air, seeking to recapture the limitlessness they once knew. Okay, and this is the last story I'm going to read. It's called Reversal. Again, it's by um, David Eagleman. There is no afterlife, but that doesn't mean we don't get to live a second time. At some point, the expansion of the universe will slow down, stop, and begin to contract. And at that moment, the arrow of time will reverse. Everything that happened on the way out will happen again, but backward. In this way, our life neither dies nor disintegrates, but rewinds. In this reverse life, you are born of the ground. At funeral cer ceremonies, we dig you up from the earth and transport you gradually to the, mortuary, to the mortuary, where the birth makeup is removed. You then are taken to the hospital, where, surrounded by doctors, you open your eyes for the first time. In your daily life, 
Broken vases reassemble. Melt water freezes into snowmen. Broken hearts find love. Rivers flow uphill. Marriages re-ride rocky roads and eventually end in erotic dating. The pleasures of a lifetime of intercourse are relived, culminating in kisses instead of sleep. Bearded men become smooth-faced children who are sent to school to gently strip away the original sins of knowledge. Reading, writing, and mathematics are expunged. After this diseducation, graduates shrink and crawl and lose their teeth, achieving the purity of the highest state of the infant. On their last day, howling because it is the end of their lives, babies climb back into the wombs of their mothers who eventually shrink and climb back into the wombs of their mothers, and so on, like concentric Russian dolls. In this reverse life, you have blissful expectations about what will come next as you experience your story backward. At the moment of reversal, you are genuinely happy, for while life must be lived forward the first time, you suspect it will really be understood only upon replay but you have a painful surprise in store. You discover that your memory has spent a lifetime manufacturing small myths to keep your life story consistent with who you thought you were. You have committed to a coherent narrative, misremembering little details and decisions and sequences of events. On the way back, the cloth of that storyline unravels, reversing through the corridors of your life You are battered and bruised in the collisions between reminiscence and reality. By the time you enter the womb again, you understand as little about yourself as you did the first time here. All right, that's the end of that. So thanks for joining and stay safe and have a good night.